2014, I set off on a voyage that would change the course of my life. Somehow I had managed to get on a trip to Antarctica through Pacific Lutheran University in Tacoma, Washington, and experience the White Continent. After a few days at sea, the continent comes into view, and you can see the mountains of Antarctica just barely over the waves of the Drake Passage. Ice floats by, and you start seeing penguins and large marine mammals in the water just everywhere. The whole ocean comes to life. For many, this is a great relief after spending so many days in one of the roughest seas in the world. The trip to Antarctica awoke this passion in me for wildlife and ecology, and I wanted to know everything about the animals living across the globe in both local and remote places. So after my undergraduate, I went on to grad school and I specialized in spatial ecology using cartography to map out where species live and why they might be in those places and to project places for recovery. Now I work with many government organi organizations and nonprofits to help preserve, conserve, and repair ecosystems across the world, helping people living in those places conserve themselves and their culture as well as the animals that live and rely on those habitats. Naturally, wanting to see all the animals in the world, I set out to find a boat worthy of circumnavigation. Having sailed on many boats before and getting to know the statistics that makes a blue water boat capable, I had a good idea of what I wanted, but not really an idea of what model. I set foot on several Tayanas, some West Sails, and uh, a few other boats, but none of them really felt right. So working with my broker, he suggested an older boat that was sitting at a marina in, in Seattle, Shilshul Marina. And even though this was kind of older than uh, my desired age, when I saw it, I, I just felt like something was right about it. So I set up a meeting. Just I didn't argue with the broker or ask him anything. I just wanted to see the boat. And from the moment I set foot on that boat and looked around, I, I knew this was going to be the one for me. The boat really spoke to me, despite all of its damage and uh, the things that have <laughs> gone wrong on it with the chain plates and the prop shaft leaking and possibly some diesel problems. It just felt like the right boat. So I ended up buying this 1969 Seafarer 36 and preparing it for circumnavigation. The refit has been extensive, and working on the boat made me realize that on an older boat, you might be dealing with asbestos in some places, so I went and uh, looked at the huge stack of information that came with the boat and found the owner's manual. In the owner's manual, I was hoping to find some information about how the boat was constructed and if it had used asbestos in some places uh, so I can be prepared to remove that. And at the top of the first like real information page, I saw the first owner's name, their address, and their phone number. Now, I thought their name looked a little bit familiar, but I kind of brushed it off and uh, tried to give the phone number a call. The phone number had been disconnected a long time ago, and uh, so I went to Facebook and looked, tried to find uh, somebody by that name on Facebook. Now, I found somebody by the name, but it, they didn't, it, they didn't, they didn't look look the type, and so I just googled the name, and what I found was incredible. The boat was named Walk, and it was bought in 1969 or 1970 by William R. Latati in Hingham, Massachusetts. As it turns out, William Latati was a famous climber and cartographer of the Antarctic. He had spent much of his climbing career on the East Coast, on Mount Washington, and on the West Coast in Juneau, Alaska, as part of the Juneau Icefield Research Program, along with his climbing partner, Maynard Miller. In 1950, he worked in Antarctica using aerial photogrammetry, which is taking pictures from a plane to create 3D maps of the landscape, to map out mountains in Antarctica for the first time and terrains that have never been set foot on. In his honor, both a mountain range and an island chain in Antarctica were named after him. Also, a peak in Juneau was named after him, and he was awarded the Antarctic Expedition Medal 
by President Ford in 1975. So during my search for answers to figure out why the boat was named Walk and more about William Latati, I reached out to some folks on Facebook uh, with the same last name, and uh, I got a response from Kevin Latati, uh, William's son, after a couple weeks, um, and he answered a lot of my questions. He also had a lot of pictures of the boat uh, from when he sailed it with his dad and uh, the rest of his family. He was able to answer the question of why the name Walk. Uh, Walk is the initials of all of William's children, ending with K, Kevin. That's another weird parallel. Is <laughs> Kevin Latati has the same initials as I do, Kevin Lester. Kevin Latati and I also are wired a lot of the same ways. We're both very creative people. Now, Kevin told me a few stories uh, when he was younger, sailing with his dad uh, in, along the East Coast. They used to uh, sail walk along uh, the main coast and uh, down the east coast with friends and family, sometimes up a river or two. But the boat was well loved and it was well taken care of by the family. They had some pretty amazing adventures and on one such uh, outing, they uh, hit something in the water that brought the boat to a complete stop and uh, left a two inch dent, dent somewhere in the keel. So. When I uh, strip down the uh, bottom paint and check that out, then that's something I'll be looking for is a patch job down there. He also told me his favorite spot to hang out was on the Bob's Day. <laughs> but I think the Bob's Day was uh, a different Bob's Day than the, the one that I have on now because the one that I have on now is totally broken. And Kevin provided a, a bunch of pictures from uh, their, their adventures in which I can see uh, the original design of some of the things, uh, some of the spaces, and uh, and where the equipment used to be. So from this per first picture, you can see the uh, not a lot has changed on the outside of the boat. It didn't come with a furling boom, which is no big surprise. And a lot of the woodwork is uh, still the same. Not a lot has been added to the uh, top side of the boat. I'll have to see if I can get that 36 at the top of the uh, mainsail uh, sewn back onto my new sail and uh, have the insignia as well. And uh, the 28, uh, I believe, is the 28th haul that they made. So maybe that as well. So as you can see, uh, the cleat on the binnacle was meant for the main sheet and the uh, control for the motor was also on the binnacle. The origin the teak reel wheel that uh, I believe William made for the boat uh, is nowhere to be found. It was lost somewhere between the Kevins and uh, and the piano hinge doors are on also on the uh, uh, companionway. You can see that the top of the laz, uh, all the lazes are as uh, nice teak wood. In this picture, you can see that there is uh, knobs on those piano doors, uh, which is not on there right now. And the uh, there are a bunch of instruments on the starboard side in a case that I don't recognize. Uh, and that makes sense because this is from 1973. So that's how it used to be. And that explains some of the screw holes there. In this picture, you get another view of that starboard side uh, control panels. Um, it looks like the case is either removable or this picture was taken before the case was built. And uh, you can see at the edge, uh, there's uh, the top of the laz. It was made out of uh, really nice wood, uh, not kind of the uh, plywood that uh, has rotted out there now. In this picture, you can see that the chimney is on the starboard side, and that must go to uh, a stove or something small on the uh, starboard side. Um, and there's no chimney on the port side. so. That was added later. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what was going on in there because um, I don't have any pictures of the interior, but uh, if I do get any more, then I will update, uh, do a little update in a future video. Additionally to the boat pictures, Kevin provided a lot of pictures of his dad, William, and uh, his time in Antarctica. Uh, this is a picture, I believe, of uh, the Juno ice program. And, uh, and this kind of goes to show why William uh, bought the Seafarer 36 in that uh, his whole family is above six foot and uh, they were sick of uh, crouching down into uh, small boats and uh, the Seafarer definitely has a lot of headspace so it makes sense that uh, t a family of tall people would buy uh, a boat with a lot of headspace like uh, the Seafarer. That being said, it does have quite the windage, and uh, if it's blowing pretty good, you don't have to put any sails up. You'll still be going about a knot.
Here is a picture that William took over Antarctica during the uh, Rare program. A fun fact about the uh, Rare program was that it was uh, one of the last private funded Antarctic programs from uh, that ran from 1947 to 1948 to uh, map out uh, parts of Antarctica. And uh, just goes to show, you know, that landscape is amazing and really hard to map covered in ice and snow and the conditions are not ideal because i know you know because it's antarctica and here's william in front of the plane that he used um to give you an idea of the kind of guy william was uh he would give you a gift and then he'd take it apart uh, this is a story from kevin by the way uh and uh, put it back together because he was a very practical guy he wanted to know how things were made and put together and uh and how could they be made better or uh, made waterproof or you know just a very engineer friendly kind of guy the parallels between me and the first owner of my boat are incredible and unmistakable i use cartography and photogrammetry to help map wildlife in 3d and I have a special connection with both the Arctic and the Antarctic. And I have climbed several very interesting mountains, um, some of which he also climbed. And we've been to several of the same Antarctic islands. It is an honor to have his boat now and, and take it on an adventure around the world. What a fascinating thing that two men in two very different generations, both with drive for expedition and seeing the edges of the world would arrive at the same exact boat. Now, while it pains me that I'm refitting the boat for blue water, I know that he would probably be behind the, those decisions as he was also a very practical, adventurous man. On my way around the world, I hope to stop in Huntington, New York, where the boat was built in 1969 and in Massachusetts, where he sailed it and visit his house in Hingham. I would also like to meet Kevin Latati and anybody else who has enjoyed the boat over the years. But I have a few years before I can do that. In the meantime, I hope to do his legacy justice and continue exploring to the edges of the world. Thanks for watching. You can follow the Patreon for Project Seawolf. And now there is a map showing all the places we have been, the anchorages, some notes, and, uh, and links to the episodes for each of those locations and routes. So check that out if you're interested. Otherwise, continue enjoying watching me refit the boat, and uh, hopefully we can get her in, back in the water soon. Thank you.